Well, I can still remember very vividly when I first came to Christ back in 1989. So we're going on almost 30 years now. And it was a turning point in my life, really, that year uh, for several reasons. It was kind of the time that I was, I was finishing college. And I lived in this house, uh, this crazy house with eight other guys my, my last year there. And uh, we were just all wild and immature and um, we all kind of got to the point that we realized, you know, we got to grow up. Uh, we graduated together for the most part, and we had our careers, and mine was to be a public educator. And with college over, it also meant the end of my athletic career. That was kind of done, put that on the shelf. I used to bounce at the, the bars in the summertime, and, and that came to an end as well. But what was so exciting about that specific time of my life is when, is when God opened my heart to see my need for Jesus Christ. Now, I think I've told you before, I didn't grow up in a Christian family. I can only think of one time in my entire life that my entire family went to church. And I don't know what got into dad. It was like junior high-ish age for me. But he said on a resurrection Sunday morning, he got us in the car and he said, we're going to church today. That's the only time our family ever went to church. I never had any Christian friends. I don't think I ever walked into, except that situation, a Protestant church in my entire life. At least I can't remember any. Um, No one ever really even shared the gospel with me. All I knew was I was finishing college, and life as it was presented to me wasn't working. I just knew that there had to be more to life then all these things that the world told me, if I achieve success in these areas, you will be happy. I feel like I was pretty successful in all of those areas, and it wasn't producing happiness. It wasn't producing satisfaction. I knew there had to be something more. I felt the guilt and the weight of my sin, and I knew in some way, shape, or form, and I didn't know exactly what that meant, that God was the solution. And by God's grace, I start on my own, on my own, no one's prodding me, I just start exploring. And I end up in a good Bible teaching church, just a good church that taught God's word faithfully. And for the first couple of years, again, I'm uh, 23-ish or so at the time, I kind of kept to myself. I bought a house, and I was living by myself, I was a teacher, as I said, and all I would do is read my Bible. Again, no one beat me over the head and said, you need to be in the Word. I just knew that the answers were in this book. And I would read this book. I would just study this book. It came very natural to me. I just couldn't get out of it. And when I saw something in the book that my life didn't align with, I would seek by God's grace to be that person. And it was radical. All these changes were happening in my life. And it was an exciting time in my life where it was basically just me and the Lord. And my attitude was, man, I am am all in for Jesus. I'm leaving all that garbage behind. I'm forsaking all of that stuff. And I'm going all in for Jesus. And I remember the joy and the peace, the purpose. My life never seemed better. My life never seemed more complete. And I remember no one ever telling me, you know, you need to go out and you need to share your faith. I just felt it was natural to do that. One is because this was the most important thing going through my life at the time. And when you have something you're excited about, it's only natural God has wired us to want to talk about it. If we don't want to talk about Jesus, we're really not excited about Jesus. It just comes natural. And I also felt that what God had done for me, I wanted him to do that for other people that I love, my friends and my family, because none of them knew the Lord, none of them. So I wanted to talk to them about Jesus. I wanted to share the experiences that I experienced. I wanted to them to know that, that there's a God out there and there's this God that loves them and, and that they too can be forgiven and it doesn't cost anything. It's free and it's life-changing and it's, it's satisfaction. And I was so happy and I thought, boy, by all means, they'll, they'll want this as well, right? And I came to realize very quickly that they didn't. <laughs> they wanted nothing to do with it. And I remember being um, very confused. 
I was very confused. Um, I can still remember to this day what people said to me almost 30 years ago. I won't give last names because I never know when these sermons go on the internet who's listening to them. But I remember um, I, was in a, I was doing a master's class and we had to go away and we were sleeping in some retreat center and a guy that I played football with said, uh, you know, he goes, hey, can I talk to you? And I said, yeah, no problem, what's up? And he said, um, you know, it's okay to be religious, but you're fanatical. You've, you've gone too far with this. It makes you think. And I remember um, a, a lady I taught with about my age, she drove me home one day after something at the school, and, and we were just talking, and I was sharing Christ with her, and she said, she goes, I used to know you before, and I know you now, and you're different. And she said to me, she goes, don't you think you're missing out on all the fun you used to have? Aren't you missing out in, on life, on fun? And I remember another guy, we were um, actually eating pizza. And he said, I, I was telling him what, where I'm at, and he goes, you know what? He goes, um, that's all great, but it's, it's too late for you. He goes, I know your life. It's too late. You've been too bad. You can't erase that. Don't bother. I can remember even a family member that wrote me a long letter, long letter of, I think you're in a cult, and here's like six ways to pull out of it. We don't like opposition. The Bible teaches in the parable of the four soils that there are some that will start their walk with Christ and they will receive opposition and it will derail them. They'll walk away from Jesus. Um, that temptation was there. But I, I thought about what they said and I prayed about what they said, and I, I didn't run away, but I, I tried to find answers to the things that they said. Is it fanatical, or does God want us to, in that sense, be fanatical? I mean, if he says, love me with all of your heart, isn't that being fanatical? All of your heart? And, and what makes a cult? A, a religious organization that brainwashes you because they don't use the Bible and they're doctrinally off base. And I'm like, everything I believe is right from the Word of God. And what does it mean to be forgiven? That, that the past can't be erased? That you get to a certain point where God's no longer going to accept you? You see, my point I'm trying to make is this made me stronger because it made me dig into the Word and it made me examine the things that were being said and it made me come up with responses to these people so I could answer my critics. 2 Timothy 3.12 Indeed, all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. There's your promise. Jesus, Matthew 10, 22. You will be hated by all because of my name. But it's the one who endures to the end that will be saved. Opposition is inevitable. If you open your mouth for Jesus and you live a life that honors his name by pursuing holiness, the world will hate you. Now, we could go many directions with that thought. Preach a sermon on the need to evangelize. Preach a sermon on the need to live as light in the midst of a dark world. We can preach a sermon on the need to speak truth even if it offends people. Again, we offend obviously with the truth, not because we're jerks. And I've been dealing with that long enough, and I'm very discouraged with the general status, not this church, but the so-called church in this world, that the way they respond to other people is just arrogant and annoying, and if that's what it means to be a Christian, I wouldn't want to be a Christian either. I should never offend because of that. But what I want to talk about this morning with the time we have left is what I believe is the main point from Luke chapter 4, that no one in the history of the world was more opposed and hated and still is more opposed and hated than Jesus. I don't know about you, but I wonder why. What did he ever do wrong? Why does the world hate Jesus so much? 
I was talking to a brother in the church Wednesday night prayer meeting, and he goes, yeah, my school, we, we're doing Black History Month. And I'm like, okay, that's good. And a kid came up, and he gave a big speech on Martin Luther King. I said, that's great. And he goes, the kid could not bring it to himself to say that he was a Christian, this Martin Luther King Jr., that all of his teachings were from, like, Buddha. I'm like, he was the Reverend Martin Luther King. They can't give Jesus the credit. It kills them. Why did they hate Jesus? Why does the world hate Jesus? Why are we persecuted when we mention Jesus? The question should not be for any Christian, listen carefully if you're a new believer, why am I being persecuted? The question should be maybe, why am I not being persecuted, right? John 15, 8, the world hates you, Jesus said. If they hate you, know that it hated me before it hated you. So let's see why they hated Jesus. That's where we're going today, okay? I mentioned before that the writer of this gospel is Luke. You know that. And I mentioned before that Luke does not seek to write in a chronological format. So if you're trying to find this thing chronological, it's not going to work for you because he jumps all over the place. He works in an organized, systematic way. He's trying to make a point. He's not just trying to give us information about Jesus. He's got a point he's trying to make that he's driving through all these passages, and you've got to find what that is. It's a logical presentation. And so far in chapter 4, our author has a clear purpose in mind. Clear. Last week, Jesus runs into Satan, and it's what? Opposition. This week, Jesus runs into people from his own hometown, and it's opposition. There's a point that he's trying to make. But before we get to the opposition, let's look at our first point in your sermon notes, which is our Lord's popularity. You're not going to get much of that from Luke. He doesn't cover that material. If you want to see how the beginning of our Lord's ministry went, you've got to go to John chapter 2, John chapter 3. Luke skips over. He doesn't, he doesn't want to cover that. That's not making the point he's trying to make. But if you read John and you read a couple things here, you read from the very, very, very beginning, people accepted Jesus. Look at verse 14. Luke 4, verse 14. News about him, Jesus, spread throughout the surrounding district. It was, it was good news. How do I know it was good news? Look at verse 15. And he began teaching in their synagogues, and he was what? Praised by who? All. Very beginning, they all loved him. And now we've got to get in the context here, folks, or else we're not going to understand this. Where is Jesus at? in this context. He's in Nazareth. Nazareth was his hometown. They knew him. Jesus never sinned. This guy, they they knew there was something unique about this guy. He never sinned. Not only did he not do anything bad, but he he was like the best friend you could have. He, He always loved you. He was always gentle with you. He was always patient. He never lost his cool. He was compassionate. He was serving. We learned in Luke chapter 2 that from a very young age, he was with the most spiritual elite in the temple, and they're talking about deep theological concepts. Verse 23, Luke tells us he already did some miracles in Capernaum. Capernaum. I mean, this this is a rising star. He's embraced by all the people in the area. This is our homeboy Jesus. We love this guy. I mean, it's almost like if we're watching a Yankees game and we're like, like going back a couple years now, there's Derek Jeter. He attended Grace Bible Church his whole life. We, we tell everybody that. We saw him growing up. I taught him in Sunday school when he was in, 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 in my second grade class. Oh, he, I was his one instructor. I have to memorize a few of his early verses, Derek Jeter. I mean, you could be a Red Sox fan and still get excited about that, right? This was Jesus. So one day, verse 15, look in your Bibles. He is teaching in the synagogue. Synagogue service could have been inside, could have been outside. We don't know. If you were rich, you had a nice building. If you didn't, you met kind of out in the fields. And you'd start off and you'd sing some psalms. You'd, you'd recite the 18 benedictions. You'd uh, uh, recite the, the, the Shema, the great Shema. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Deuteronomy 6. You, you'd read some scripture. You'd have a sermon after the scripture. And you'd close with Aaron's blessing from Numbers chapter 6. You know, the Lord be with you. 
Jesus was asked to teach, it says. Just staying in the text here. Now, they didn't have a New Testament back then. First of all, the Jews wouldn't accept the New Testament. But second of all, it wasn't what? It wasn't written yet. There was no New Testament. Genesis to Malachi, that's all they had. And everything they had was a scroll. You didn't have the printing press back then. You didn't have books. You didn't have a printing press that you could run things through a machine and all of a sudden, within a minute, it prints all these words on the page for you. It's a big scroll. You know what a scroll is, right? And the scroll, in order to have a scroll, it was copied by hand. How would you like to write a Bible by hand? And you make one mistake on the scroll, you know, this goes, right? You have to tear it up and start all over again. You couldn't cross out words. So if you were a poor town like Nazareth, you probably only had a couple scrolls. And we read here that the, the book of the prophet of Isaiah, verse 17, was handed to him. Maybe Jesus said, I want to read Isaiah. Maybe they just said, we want you to read Isaiah. No chapters, no verses. Jesus obviously knew his Bible pretty well. Right? And he turns right away to the place he wanted to read from. And we know this was Isaiah 61, verses 1 and 2. In Luke 4, 18 and 19, that passage is written for us in our Bible. Jesus said, the Spirit of the Lord, he's quoting Isaiah 61, is upon me because he anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He sent me to proclaim the release to the captives, recovery to the sight to the blind, set free those who are oppressed to proclaim the favorable year of the Lord. Isaiah was written about 600 years before Jesus came on the scene. And when he read Isaiah 61, every good Jew knew exactly what that passage was teaching. Which is what? The Messiah will come one day. That God, in his predetermined plan, will send forth the Deliverer. God will send forth one day to the Jewish people the Messiah. Verse 18, it says God's Spirit would be upon him. You know what that means? That he'd be the anointed one. He'd be anointed. What does that mean? It means the Greek word is Christos. Christos. It means uh, anointed. It's where we get the word Christ from. Jesus' last name was not Christ. He was Jesus, son of Joseph, who is the Christ, who is the anointed one, or in Hebrew, who is the Messiah. Verse 18, his mission would be to heal the poor, release the captives, give sight to the blind, set free the oppressed. That's what he's going to do. Now, most people look at this and say, There's, that's all physical stuff. And there was a physical dimension to this. I don't deny that. But primarily what Jesus is getting at when he reads this is a spiritual dimension. What I mean by that is he, he did help blind people see. But there's a lot of people that love Jesus that never get their sight back. There's a spiritual dimension to this. For instance, like it says, we're poor. He came to people who were poor, who would acknowledge that they're poor. That, that are spiritually in debt in regards to their favor to do anything that is pleasing to God. In other words, they stand before God one day on Judgment Day and they pull out their spiritual portfolio and regardless of all the church attendances they went to and all the good deeds that they done and all the religious stuff in their baptism, it means nothing if they're depending upon that to be right with God. You are spiritually in debt. You're a slave to sin. You deserve hell. You can't make yourself right before God because you're poor. And the Messiah came to do for us what we could not do for ourselves, and that is to make us rich in His grace. That's the kind of richness we get from Christ. Spiritually blind. That means on our own, we don't see God. No one on their own just says, I see God. I, I understand Him. The Bible makes sense to me. I I, I want God. He, he's got to open the eyes, or a metaphor used in, in Acts with Paul, scales falling from his eyes. You've got, you got to remove the spiritual blindness. We are born spiritually blind, and the Messiah is going to open our eyes to people that are groping around in darkness and help us see the truth. 
I didn't care about God before I got saved. But one day I did. I probably was one of those guys that would line up, I don't think in a big way, but even make fun of people that were really religious. But one day I became one of those guys. Also says we were captive and oppressed. Bondage. We were in sin and we loved our sin. And we were ruled by our sin and we, we couldn't get out of our sin. It was, a, it was a spiritual bondage that had us in shackles and we had no way to deliver ourselves. And, and we didn't realize it, but before Christ, we were a tool of the devil. I hear what, you know, you get on... On, on the news uh, uh, websites, and you listen to the newscasts, and you, you hear what people are saying nowadays. And you're like, they have no clue how wrong they are. They have no clue at how much they're opposing God, but in their heart of hearts, they believe they are so right. They're oppressed. They are a tool used by Satan. They are plagued with all kinds of guilt. They have no hope. They're groping around in this world for significance. They're turning from one false god to another false god, which is leading to just greater spiritual slavery. This Messiah is going to come, and he'll deliver them from that bondage to sin and to Satan and to death. He's going to break those spiritual shackles and provide spiritual liberation. And this Messiah, verse 19, will proclaim the favorable year of the Lord. That is in connection with Leviticus 25, the year of the Jubilee. The year of the Jubilee, 50 years where all of Israel is set free from any kind of bondage or debt. Everything's canceled. Everything's taken away. It's a year of grace. And Jesus is the ultimate Jubilee that comes to set us free spiritually. And this freedom is available to anyone who will humble themselves enough to receive it. Don't don't forget that thought, because I'm going to come back to that. These are amazing promises from Isaiah. And verse 20 says, he read them. He gave the book, the scroll, back to the attendant. And he sat down, Jesus sat down. Sitting down was the way you taught back then. You read standing up, and then you sit to teach. And it says, all the eyes were fixed on him. You got the picture? What's he going to say? Hometown hero. Just read a great section of scripture. What's he going to say? And he begins his sermon with these amazing words. He says, today, this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. Wait, what? What did he say? What did he say? Did he say what I thought he said? He just read about the great Messiah that was, would come, and he, he just got done saying, basically, you're looking at him. I'm here. He's arrived. I'm him. Now you're saying, okay, connecting the dots. He started off with opposition. You got my mind going on the opposition thing. Popularity, I looked at my notes. Second point is opposition. So here's the point where it turns the corner. And almost every sermon I've ever heard on this passage does that. And almost all the commentaries I read do that as well. This is the point when he says he is the Messiah that they reject him. But maybe I'm wrong, but I don't think they rejected him. That's if you take verse 22 seriously. The response from the people was not negative, but if I just read English for English, it was positive. And they were speaking what? Well of him. He just said he's the Messiah? And those people going, yes, we knew it. And they were wondering at the gracious words that were falling from his lips. Let's keep this in context again here. They knew there was something special about Jesus. You got to go back in the first century. They were looking forward to the Messiah, and the expectation for the Messiah was at a super high, all-time frenzy. 
As a matter of fact, if you read Jewish history, you read that there were a number of people that came that said they were the Messiah, and they crowned these guys the Messiah, only to realize later on that, oh, we were wrong on that one. And someone else would come on the scene, I'm the Messiah. Hey, there he is, he's here. And he'd get like 100 followers and all these disciples. And then they're like, well, we were wrong on that one too. I don't believe they rejected Jesus because he said that. I believe, I believe, you don't hear this in the sermons on this, they sought to accept him as Messiah. I mean, you can imagine the people in that synagogue saying, this is one of our boys. Yeah, Hank, it's one of ours, man. As the text says, this is Joseph's son, Joseph the carpenter, who's got the shop just right down the road. This is Joseph's son. He's a, he's a Nazarene. You know, everybody keeps telling us, nothing good comes out of Nazareth, right? That we're a loser town. Not anymore. Not anymore. He's the local hero. He put us on the map. God has sent the Messiah to our town. This is great. Now it gets really weird. You think that was weird. It's going to get weird. If that's all true, and I believe it is, how is Jesus going to respond to that? If I were Jesus... I'd be like, man, I'm glad you guys saw that. You know, and we're going to do great things, and God's going to do wonderful things, and man, it's going to be a good plan. You're going to be worshiping me, and, and I'm going to be doing miracles. I'm going to be feeding you guys free food, and, and we're just going to usher God's kingdom right in now, now. Thank you. Thank you for, thank you for believing in me. Thank you. He doesn't do that. Now things shift. Second point, verse 23 and 24. He said to them, no doubt you will quote this proverb to me, physician, heal yourself. What we heard was done in Capernaum. Do here in your hometown as well, he says. And he said to them, truly I say to you, no prophet is welcome in his hometown. Basically what he says to them is this. All you folks that are embracing me as Messiah here in Nazareth in this synagogue, are all receiving me for the wrong reasons. You think you know what Messiah means, but you don't. You think I'm on line with where you guys are acting and what you believe, but I'm not. God will never permit people to accept him for something or someone other than who he is. Don't forget that. We want to do that as human beings. We want to create God in our image and kind of return the favor. God says it's not allowed. You can't come up with some conception because of some dream you had and I have to play by those rules that I'm that kind of God. I am God Almighty and I don't change for the people that I created. They have to accept me on my terms. This was a problem then, and it's a problem today. Read the Bible. Jesus feeds the masses, and all of a sudden, everybody loved Jesus back then. Then he basically said, I'm going to stop feeding you, and it says many of his disciples walked away from him. Jesus was doing miracles. Oh, man, miracles. That's better than anything we've ever seen from any magician. Who doesn't want to be a part of the Jesus show? I'm not, it's not about the miracles, folks. It's not about the free food, folks. People today want to cherish their sin and say that I can have Jesus and I can just keep sinning because Jesus is a forgiving God. And that's the way it works. It's all about free grace. No, it doesn't. People back then believed that the Messiah would be the political deliverer that will overthrow the Romans. And that's not why Jesus came. And they didn't like that very much. People think today that Jesus can be an add-on to your life. You know, you got this, and you got that, and you got Jesus, and that's good. Rather than He is your life. He's everything. If He can't be everything, He's nothing more than a hobby. He's God. People today want to run around and tell you that it's all about Jesus wants to make you, you healthy, and Jesus wants to make you prosperous, and Jesus wants to make you rich. False gospel. Could he have made it any clearer, folks? Just stay within this passage in Isaiah. He came to deliver people that knew that they were spiritually blind. That was his mission. 
to make you rich with grace because you're blind and oppressed and you need deliverance and to give you healing, but ultimately spiritual healing. And it would be available for everyone who would simply be humble enough to admit it. And he didn't come to bring it to just the Jews. He came to bring that to all the nations. And that's where the Jews had a problem. Wait, 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 wait. Are you saying, are you saying, Jesus, that we're spiritually blind? Are you saying that me, as a child of Abraham, that I need to be liberated by you? I got royal, divine blood running through my veins. We are the chosen people of God. He has given us his law. We got the temple. We got all these things. We have followed God faithfully for our entire lineage. We don't need this stuff that you're telling us. And we're even more offended that you would tell us that you are coming not just for the Jews, but also for all the nations. Are you telling me Gentiles are going to be saved? Are you telling me God loves Gentiles as well? That was the problem. So what Jesus does is he tells them some Bible stories. Obviously, they can't have a problem with something that's written in their Bible. He says, let me tell you a story first from 1 Kings 17, beginning in verse 25. He says, but I say to you in truth. Literally in the Greek, it's, it's uh, amen, where we get the word amen from. And what Jesus is basically saying is, um, I say amen before I even speak. We say amen after someone speaks. If I said to you, I'm going to pray, I'm going to pray, and then uh, uh, before I pray, I want you to say amen. But like, no, I can't say amen before you pray. I don't know what you're going to say. Amen is like an agreement in or of. You've got to pray first, then I say amen. No, I said, I want you to say amen before I pray. Jesus can do that because he always speaks truth. Amen, he says. There were many widows in Israel in the days of Elijah, the great prophet, when the sky was shut up for three years and six months, when a great famine came over the land, yet Elijah was sent to none of them but to Zarephath in the land of Sidon to a woman who was a widow. What's he saying? There are a lot of widows in Israel. God bypassed them, self-righteous Jew, and went to a widow in Gentile territory. And saved her. Yeah, that hasn't sunk in yet. Let me give you another one. Second Kings chapter 5. You know this one, beginning in verse 27. Another Bible story. There were many lepers in Israel during the time of Elisha the prophet, and none of them was cleansed, but only Naaman the Syrian. Wait, are you telling us that God loves Gentiles? Are you telling us God bypasses Israel to help Gentiles? Are you telling me that God loves women? So if I'm getting this correctly, I believe that they accept the fact that Jesus is the Messiah, but they cannot accept the fact that God loves Gentiles. And that unless the Jews humble themselves and acknowledge their spiritual bankruptcy and desperation, as did these two Gentiles, they'd be judged. The Gentiles are going to get saved, and they'll enter the kingdom and you, Jew, will be on the outside looking in. There's no entitlement here. What I'm saying is divine grace might be withheld from the Jews and given to Gentiles. That's who I am as Messiah. You still love me as Messiah? Verse 28, and all the people in the synagogue were filled with rage. Now it turns. They heard these things, and they got up and drove him out of the city and led to the brow of the cliff in which the city had been built in order to throw him off the cliff. This guy never sinned, folks. Ten minutes ago, he was the hometown hero. Ten minutes ago, they're about to crown him Messiah. And it goes from the highest reception that any human being could give to any other human being ever in the history of the world to the ugliest rage in seeking to kill him. Man. 
Verse 30, most people believe this is miraculous. He just passed through their midst. And he went his way because it wasn't time for him to die. Not yet. Brothers and sisters, I've come to learn that if we're seeking to truly live for Jesus and which will produce attitudes and behavior that will be so different from the world that when the world sees this stuff, they're not going to applaud. They're not going to pat us on the back. They'll be offended because it's exposing, whether we use words or not, darkness. And they can either join in and embrace the light or they can attack. I've come to learn that if we call ourselves a Christian, that we can still, wrongly so, live our lives in such a way that the world can still approve of who we are. It's not that hard. I've come to learn that we can talk to other people about just about anything except Jesus. I've come to learn that there are certain things that God wants us to say to other people, but because we love the acceptance of other human beings and we want to be liked, we want to meet their approval, that we choose to just zip our lips and keep our mouths closed. I've come to learn that this world has a lot of false conceptions about who God is, just like this passage today. And it's easy to say nothing to them and walk away and let them believe that they're correct. There are people out there that don't want to hear that God has no favorites. There are people out there that don't want to believe that God loves all people. That God loves people that are steeped in sin and he can save them regardless of how bad their past was. That God loves rich and God loves poor. That God loves man and God loves woman. That God loves white and God loves black. That he's a God for people, for every tribe and every tongue and every nation that he loves them all. And they all have equal access, regardless of what they look like or where they came from, to that throne of grace. If they will humble themselves enough to admit that they are spiritually in debt and they'll receive Jesus Christ for forgiveness. I've also come to learn that people don't want to hear that God will only receive those who acknowledge that they are not good. Because we as human beings have this thing called pride. And we got this thing we've been taught called self-esteem. And we want to believe that I'm a good person. And the preacher stands up and says, in the eyes of God, you're not. You're a spiritual wretch, as the song says. You're depraved and you're in your sin. Yeah, you might be better than other people on the planet. And yeah, you could be worse. But compared to God's standard, you've fallen short. And unless you're willing to admit that I have nothing to offer God, that I'm a slave to my sin, that there's nothing that I can do where God can take me into glory and say, way to go, man. We couldn't make it without you up here. You did a good job. The scale's way out in your favor. I got nothing to give. And I'm willing to stand 100% on the grace of Jesus Christ and what he accomplished for me at Calvary. If I can't do that, there's no hope. And some people just don't want to hear that because that is offensive. And some people don't want to hear that God will be God. God will not change for your lifestyle or your false doctrine that God always deals with truth. The truth that's recorded for us in Scripture. And He doesn't change. And when God deals with us, He deals with us in truth. And when we deal with God, He expects us to deal with Him in truth. 
love for God and truth that God always speaks back to us in love. And if we call ourselves his children, he expects us to do the same. To speak the truth and to do in love, regardless of how the world might respond. Father, what an example we have of Jesus Christ today. What an example of someone that could have so easily taken that praise but chose not to do so because he'd rather have no praise than false and empty praise. Lord, you know the hearts and you know the hearts of all of those people and you know the hearts of all of the people in this sanctuary today. You know those in here that, that, that don't know you, that need Christ, and we pray today that they would receive Christ. And you know the hearts potentially of people that are, that are just, they're not all in. They're just not all in. You're not their all in all. You're not their God because they, they want to worship other gods. And they want to just give you a little bit. But they're refusing to give you everything. And Lord, you know the hearts of those people in this sanctuary that are, oh, all of us falling short, but, but seeking to love you and seeking to serve you and seeking to read your word and follow your word and, and live a life that is faithful and seeking to love the lost and, and seeking to encourage the, the, the saved and, and seeking to bring you glory and acknowledging that the only goodness we have in us is what Christ has done through us. And the only hope we have of eternal life is not our own merit, but the merit that Jesus achieved for us at Calvary, the free gift that the Messiah came to bring, to open our blind spiritual eyes, to release us from the captivity, to give us spiritual freedom and liberation by breaking the shackles and allowing us through his work on the cross to also be victorious over sin, victorious over the devil, and victorious over death. Thank you, Lord, for being who you are. Help us not try to change you. Help us to love you for who you are. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.